Uh, look, we are going to provide an opportunity, of course, for all of you to put questions to Michael. We'll have uh, some microphones roving around, and if you have a question, please raise your hand uh, and uh, just uh, indicate which organisation you're from. Um, let's not get the debate going. Certainly a question to Michael. He's, uh, he's our expert on the stage today, and uh, we'd love you to be able to do that. But while you're thinking about the first, I, there's one I need to put to you, Michael. It's around... When you're looking at those jobs for the future, when you're looking at uh, what will sustain Australia in a low interest rate environment and so on, with wages perhaps that are going to be held somewhat lower th and the expectations that come from that, where do you factor in things around the technological changes that we're seeing now and the way in which we have to respond to that? You, you're aware CETA did some, reper re some work on this a couple of years ago, but how do you build in the fourth industrial revolution? How do you build in digital disruption to your estimates about what the Australian economy might look like? Well, uh, uh, but, well I mean, uh, if you look at the, uh, the track record of economists, it has to be said they've never been very good in their forecasts in incorporating exactly those uh, sort of unexpected uh, developments. Uh, now, we produce a baseline that's kind of based on history and our understanding of how the economy works uh, and, the, and the like, but it, it's very hard to, to factor in uh, the sorts of um, the things you develop, uh, you, that you point out there. Uh, they do happen rapidly, so they can change the economic and uh, market backdrop uh, just uh, as rapidly as, uh, as well. Now, all we can really suggest is, well, you need to uh, uh, be prepared to uh, adapt quickly to these uh, changes uh, and look for where the, uh, the opportunities um, uh, lie. Now, that's not to say the broader economic story is, uh, is worth ignoring uh, at all. I mean, that still will be the kind of the baseline for growth and uh, where we kind of cycle around that baseline will reflect those unexpected developments, be they political, technological uh, uh, or, uh, or what, uh, whatever. But um, uh, the tendency, I think, uh, in Australia and everywhere really is to focus on some of the negative outcomes uh, of, uh, of these developments. So we talk about disruption and the, uh, and the like, uh, and it's always easier to see where the potential uh, losers are in a sense, uh, uh, but perhaps more focus uh, on um, some of the positive uh, possibilities that are emerging uh, in this environment would, uh, would help uh, in the adjustment process. Um, again, while I'm waiting for the first question to come from the floor, and we have a couple over there, can I, can I take you to the chapter that we have in our report around the federal government budget deficit? And again, CETA did a major piece of work last year where we made some recommendations as to how uh, the government sh could tackle that. Uh, some of it is dependent upon bipartisanship and so on. But in terms of um, your analysis for the Australian economy and the impact that the uh, burgeoning federal government deficit is having on our ability to operate as an economy, uh, do you have those genuine concerns and uh, have you got any suggestions as to how a government might go about addressing that? You have talked about infrastructure spend, but there seems to be a reluctance on behalf of government to use their AAA credit rating and a, and a very, very low interest rate regime to borrow to get things going. Yes, I mean, I think uh, uh, there is just a great fear of, of debt, and let's face it, not just the government level. We all understand that uh, debt is potentially a problem for, um, for all of us. It does have to be repaid. It does come with a, a servicing cost. And you do need to kind of keep the, the pressure on to at least balance the books over the, over the longer, uh, longer term. But I think we've got in this problem in Australia of thinking that uh, all government debt uh, is, is evil in, uh, uh, in, uh, in a sense. Uh, and uh, what we really need to do perhaps is kind of disentangle what sort of spending do governments do to uh, keep the economy going. You know, the things they have to do every year like paying for schools and, uh, and teachers and hospitals and all those, those sorts of things from uh, the, uh, the infrastructure uh, task. I think if you can kind of separate that out, then it's much clearer or easier to run a case that says, well, you know, here's a uh, very important piece of transport that, uh, that we need to, uh, to build in Australia. Uh, we're going to borrow uh, money to, to build it because we need to build it now. We can't uh, just try and find some other asset that we can sell because we'll run out of those um, eventually. Uh, we can't pay for it out of um, uh, current income flows because it will just take uh, too long to get this, this critical piece of infrastructure in, in place. These bits of infrastructure do generate returns and the work that's been done in Australia and everywhere shows the, the rate of return is very high. Uh, and certainly in excess of the sort of 3% that governments can borrow money at uh, at, the, at the moment. Now we have a 
enormous queue of uh, foreign investors, you know, the big global pension funds, wealth funds and, and the like, uh, who like Australia. Uh, you know, they will be only too willing to uh, participate uh, uh, in some, some sort of long life asset because that's what they want in their own um, uh, books. Uh, and uh, you know, to be fair, if uh, that railway line we're going to build is still going to be used in 100, time, in 100 years' time, why shouldn't somebody in 100 years' time be making a contribution to that uh, through the interest payments that um, you know, we'll be making on that, um, that debt? So uh, I think we do need to move down uh, that, um, uh, that path, uh, uh, and particularly um, when you think about housing affordability. I mean, one of the interesting comments the, uh, the Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, made last week at a speech uh, was uh, that probably the best contribution we can make to improving housing affordability in Australia is by spending more on infrastructure. Now, if you make it uh, cheaper and easier for people to get around, around cities, well, all of a sudden you increase the potential size of the, um, uh, of the city and that'll have a big impact on, uh, on affordability. We also need to do it because the population, uh, like every country, is, uh, is ageing. Uh, and. Uh, when we kind of hit that point uh, where the population peaks, I think sometime in the, uh, the, the late 20, uh, 2030s in Australia's uh, case, uh, and that kind of baby boom uh, bulge is moving through into the, uh, the older age period, well, you want to hit that point at a high level of income and productivity as you can, because it makes it a much more sort of comfortable um, you know, transition, if you like, than if you hit that point at lower levels of incomes and lower levels of productivity. How do you get there? Well, infrastructure, again, is, uh, is a good way to do it. I have a question over here. Thank you. Speak in the microphone. It's not working. Oh, there it is. Uh, Joel Backwell, head of the International Education Division in the Victorian Department of Education, but formerly Australian Trade Commissioner to Malaysia. I just wanted to draw your third and fourth areas of potential growth together and ask, in, in your view, what are the investments in social and economic infrastructure that the government could be taking to take advantage of that growth in the um, Asian middle class? Uh, well, uh, uh, I think uh, it's really creating a, a backdrop uh, and a focus uh, where um, we're pursuing those, op those, uh, those opportunities. Now, we are to some extent, obviously, you can see it in the tourism flows uh, and, the, and the like, but uh, we can always do, uh, do more. You know, uh, everybody kind of understands our exposure and reliance and, and the benefits that we've got from the Asian story uh, over, over time, but the commodity bit of it, uh, we were kind of lucky in a sense, you know, we had the right combination of resources, materials and so on in the right place uh, to take uh, uh, advantage of that, uh, that Asian expansion back, uh, back then. But this kind of more service-related story, uh, I think, uh, is one we're going to have to pursue because those opportunities are, uh, are open to, um, to everybody. Uh, uh, Chinese tourists, they obviously like coming to Australia, but no doubt they like going to, uh, to other countries as well. Uh, how do we go about getting them, uh, getting them here? And uh, uh, so we are starting to see some of the infrastructure put in place, if you like. So uh, one of the few areas where we're seeing a lift in investment spending coming through is in areas that you can tie back to, uh, to tourism, for example. So we are building more hotels and, uh, and so on. And you can start to see some of this happening on the education uh, side as, uh, as well. So. Uh, uh, on the numbers, there's something like 340,000 students in Australia right now, uh, and uh, you know, they're a big source of uh, demand and activity uh, in, the, in the economy. Uh, you know, if we want more, uh, then we need the infrastructure to, uh, to support that. I have over the back. Thank you. Uh, Michael Andrew Tullock from Austria. I just wanted to follow up on that point around the growth of the Asian middle class and, and services. And my question is, where is that investment going to come from to capitalise on that opportunity? Is this going to be local investment to grow the services sectors or is part of this international opportunity going to require inward international investment from China and other places to build the capacity in Australia for having a services export overseas? Uh, well, uh, I think it'll be a combination of, uh, of both. I mean, the reality is uh, in Australia uh, we have more potential investment projects than we can fund uh, from our own savings. That's why we run this current account uh, deficit that does worry the ratings agencies and so on from, from time to time as an indication of how big uh, that gap between our national savings and national investment actually, actually is. Well, the only way you can fill it, of course, uh, is um, by uh, tapping the savings of the, um, of the rest of the, um, of the world. And uh, now the people who are going to participate uh, uh, in these sort of areas are the ones uh, where the income is, uh, is growing, I think. Uh, now, we've seen this happen before, Japan 
Now, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, was a, a classic example. Uh, there was a lot of Japanese investment going into tourism resorts um, uh, back, uh, back then, uh, uh, buying up beef cattle properties uh, as, as well. And as somebody pointed out to me, golf courses were the other uh, popular investment for, um, for J uh, Japan at the time. So I imagine we're going to see countries like China going down that, that same path. We're already starting to, um, uh, to see it. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of interest there in the agricultural uh, space. I suspect we will see it in the, uh, the tourism side uh, increasingly uh, as, uh, as well. I'm, I'm looking to the left. I never want to leave the left out in any discussions around here. Is there anybody uh, over this side of the question for Michael? I can go back to the right side of the room. That's fine. If not, I have... Oh, sorry. Lisa. I'm Michael, Lisa Paul, uh, company director of various things. Um, I think the elephant in the room is the elephant curve, I really do. I think that, you know, the, if, you, if you're at all worried about instability in democracy now, and I am, then that 70 to 90 percentile people who have just been stuck with wages, with their wages over the last 20 years is a, is a real social issue. and an, and therefore, an economic issue. Um, what can be what can be done? It's it kind of comes down to, you know, their cost of living has gone up. Their wages have been stuck for a long time, and now it's playing out in a social sense. What, what's your view about how much the economists can look at that and and analyse that and recommend ways to change it? Well, uh, I'm one of the tasks uh, for our politicians and probably our economists as well is perhaps to spell out a bit more clearly you know, where the benefits um, uh, from um, um, all of these reforms and what's been happening uh, have, have actually um, uh, come, uh, come through. Uh, as I say, it's always very easy to see the, the downside, uh, but unless somebody points out to you the upside, I think it's, uh, it's much less, uh, less visible. So there, there, there's a kind of a marketing uh, task um, uh, here. Uh, uh, a lot of it, I think, in Australia's case, does reflect that extended period of very weak income growth. Uh, now we've had three or four years now where household incomes have grown by about 2% a year. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, from the household's perspective, everything they buy is certainly going up at a much faster rate uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, than 2% 2, uh, 2 a year. So it, it plays into that story about people viewing uh, uh, their kind of uh, financial standards as, as going backwards or certainly not making any, uh, any headway at, uh, at all. Well, I think the, the change in the income story will, will help there. Uh, you know, we would expect uh, household incomes to grow a little bit more quickly um, uh, from, um, uh, from here. And uh, uh, now I've mentioned two areas. Uh, I said governments need to lose their fear of debt. Uh, businesses need to have some more realistic expectations. And maybe the other option we need to look at here is uh, uh, you know, some sort of um, uh, national wage case for one of a, uh, a better um, uh, description. You know, the reality is governments used to exert a fair amount of influence on household income growth through uh, that kind of centralised wage fixing system we had. Now, I don't want to suggest we should be going back uh, uh, to those days, but I mean, right now, uh, handing out um, some money to, uh, to households uh, would uh, be giving it to the group um, uh, that uh, is most likely to spend it, get some benefit from it, generate some economic uh, activity. Uh, with a positive flow back, I think, into uh, the uh, the capital spending story as um, uh, as well. And uh, I, for one, have uh, uh, guaranteed that I'll spend whatever wage rise uh, my company cares to um, to give me as part of that uh, that process. Michael, thank you. That's uh, probably a good place uh, to stop now and to thank you for your contribution, not only uh, for the clarity of your thought and the answers that you've given to the questions put to you this morning, but also your contribution in writing the chapter for our economic and political overview for 2017. Please join with me in thank Michael Blythe.